Uh, we're finishing up the book of Daniel, and we're in Daniel chapter 12, so we're at the very last chapter here. And so I hope that going through this book, you've uh, it hasn't been too confusing, or that things have been that have cleared up maybe some things that were confusing in this book, um, as far as uh, end times prophecy or just understanding it and stuff like that. But Daniel 12 is really kind of a conclusion. We see this is really the conclusion to that uh, that great vision. So in, da- in Daniel chapter 10, going all the way to the end here, this is all one vision. But verse 1 there is packed. So dealing with timeline, and that's what we're going to see here. If, I, I basically said Daniel 12 timelines. There's a lot of timelines in here, and I'm, and I'm just going to go through the whole bunch of timelines uh, dealing with Revelation and all that stuff just to show you how all that works. So you can see it all on that chart, but that's overwhelming. When, you, when you're kind of going into that and be like, what am I looking at? So I want to show you what each one represents and kind of just go through that. Um, and so that's why this is up here. We're not playing Pictionary or anything like that right now. Um, I know I got the kids excited, but that's probably honestly what we use that board more, mostly for is, is games. Um, but, uh, but in Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. This one verse has a lot of information. Really what you see is from the very beginning of that seven-year period till the rapture is what you see here. And this, I believe, this this theme or this, this time frame is being repeated through this book from this verse right here to the middle ver- the middle thing dealing with that angel or that man in linen talking about it, but also with the number of the 1335 days, okay? That's what I'm going to be really kind of honing in on is that, and I'm going to show you some cool things with that. Um, but obviously, what do we see here first? At that time shall Michael stand up. So when we came out of Daniel chapter 12, it kind of ended with the Antichrist being, uh, he'll, he shall come to his end and none shall help him. So you see a conclusion with that. Well, in Daniel chapter 12, you're kind of kicking back and seeing where does this start, okay? And so that's what's going on here is that it's kind of like if you read a book and then you kind of had a recap of what you just read, okay, or a recap of events. And so um, we see Michael standing up. That fits with Revelation chapter 12, Revelation 12, 7. You can go there and look there, and that's where really... If you look at Revelation, you see Revelation 1 through 11 is chronological, and then it kicks back in Revelation 12, and it's chronological from 12 to 22. And Revelation 12, it starts off, and it's, it's talking about this child being born, which is obviously the Lord Jesus Christ. He's caught up to his throne. But then it goes straight into dealing with this dragon coming after the woman and this time period that's going on. But what starts that off is Michael and his angels, Michael the archangel. So in verse 7 there of Revelation 12, it says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was there a place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So that's what starts this whole thing off. You know, that's what starts off this seven-year period or this... One, this one week that the, the Antichrist is confirming his covenant. And the only place that we see a seven years like mentioned, really, is Daniel chapter 9, which is uh, dealing with uh, you know, that last week. So you have 70 weeks that are determined, and 69 weeks is when the Messiah is cut off, and then there's going to be one more week. There's going to be one more set of seven years that uh, you know, the... the Antichrist is going to confirm his covenant. And so, but like I said, when we were going through Daniel, and we saw in Daniel uh, 4 that Nebuchadnezzar was given the heart of the beast for how long? Seven times. So that's seven. So we see a time, times, and half a time used on both sides of that spectrum, and you see that seven times. So when you look at the timeline, and if you can't see this board, you may want to uh, scoot over to where you can actually see it. This is kind of like the seven, the whole seven-year period is what we'll see here. Seven years. And you can see, you know, that's one called one week. In some places, it's called seven times in another place. And what we're going to see is that a lot of these other timelines are smaller portions of that seven years, okay? 
So you never see anything more than seven years, right? All these timelines that you see in Daniel and Revelation, nothing is more than seven years. And so uh, we're going to get more into that, but I just wanted to kind of start off with that as far as Michael. This is where Michael and, and, and his angels, Michael the archangel, makes war in heaven, casts out the devil, and that's what starts this thing off, okay? And so uh, then it goes on in verse 1 there. It says, The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. Now that sounds very familiar. Go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. So it says there's going to be this time of trouble such as never was. Since there was a nation. Doesn't that sound very familiar to how it states that in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and just other places? And you say, well, it says trouble. It doesn't say tribulation. Trouble, tribulation, affliction, all those things are interchangeable. I'm going to prove that to you. But uh, if you're going through trouble, you're going through tribulation. Okay? And uh, verse uh, 21, so Matthew 24 and verse 21, it says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And so it, it, we see here that it says great tribulation. Go to Mark 13 and verse 19. Mark 13 and verse 19. I want you to see that, you know, we call it the great tribulation. But in some places it calls it great affliction. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with calling it the great tribulation. But... Uh, it's not really, you know, there, there is a place in, in Revelation uh, 7 where it says these are the, those that came out of great tribulation. But you've got to understand, it's not really called like a, it's not like an event necessarily. It's just basically telling you what's going on during that time. And we use that as kind of describing that time of, you know, the great tribulation, right? Um, but really it's just saying they're in great tribulation, they're in great affliction, they're in great trouble, Right? In, Ma in Mark chapter 13, verse 19, it says, For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created on this, uh, unto this time, neither shall be. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved, but for the elect's sake, whom he had chosen, he has shortened the days. So we see that there's this great tribulation. And honestly, what we're going to see when we get into the timelines is that's going to start basically in the midst of the week. So right here is where that's going to start. And what it's saying is that basically we were appointed unto tribulation or great tribulation for that whole rest of that time, but those days were shortened. Okay, and that's what we're going to get into. And one thing I'm going to really show you is that we're not going to be going through that whole seven years. Okay, uh, we're going to be delivered out of that. So that's what it's saying here in this verse is it's saying that there's going to be trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. So it's basically saying all the saved. All the saved, all those that are believers, are going to be delivered out of that great tribulation or that great trouble. And what it's stating when it says that in, in Revelation, or Matthew chapter 24 and, verse, and, and Mark 13, it's telling you you're going to go through great tribulation, but it's been shortened. Okay? Meaning that what we're going to see is that you were given into the Antichrist's hands for a longer period of time, but it was shortened because no flesh would have been saved. So basically he cuts that off and delivers us out of that before the end of it. Okay? Or we would have been there for that whole seven-year period. Okay? And so, um, but Daniel 12 is actually going to show us that timeline as far as when we're going to be delivered out of it. Um, and I'm going to really prove that to you later on. So that, if there's anything that I want to really get into is that 1335 days and what that's talking about. Um, but go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, because people are all constantly saying this. They're like, well, you know, there's a seven-year tribulation period, which never calls it that, by the way. And then they'll say, well, God hasn't appointed us on the wrath. Well, I thought you said it was tribulation. You know what I mean? Do you see how it never fits, like, what they're saying? They're like, oh, it's the seven-year tribulation period, but we're not appointed on the wrath. Wait a minute. What they're doing, though, is they're saying tribulation and wrath are the same thing. Okay. Now, obviously, God can pour out tribulation on people, and it would be his wrath. It would be troubling to them, right? Wrath is trouble to them, and tribulation and, and, and you know, affliction to them. 
But what we're dealing with is this great tribulation is on the believers, okay? This is on those that are saved and those that hold the testimony of Jesus Christ. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, I just want you to see that we are appointed unto tribulation. We're not appointed unto wrath, God's wrath. And so in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. And, you know, that's why I went to Mark 13, because what did it use as far as terminology when it's talking about the Great Tribulation? Affliction. Then it goes further. The next verse says, For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to, pa uh, even as it came to pass, and ye know. So it gets both of them there. We're, gonna, we're appointed unto affliction, and we are, and it says we should go through tribulation. Okay? And this isn't a whole sermon on that, but go to 2 Thessalonians chapter uh, 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I just want you to see that trouble and tribulation used interchangeably. Uh, because in, in Daniel, it's using that term trouble. Uh, but like I said, that's the same thing as tribulation. So it's basically saying that they're going to go through tribulation such as never was since there was a nation. Okay? And Matthew and Mark is saying, it, not even since it was a nation, but since the world began. Okay? So... The, the Gospels are giving you more information, saying it's even worse than that. It's worse than even before that nation even was there. It's before the, the creation, you know, since the creation of the world, there hasn't been tribulation like this. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse 5, it says, Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye, ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Notice this. This is the tribulation he's recompensing unto them for the trouble that they put them through, right? In flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed, in that day. So, it's, notice how it's using that interchangeably, saying basically he's recompensing tri tribulation unto them that trouble you. So they're reaping what they've sowed. So what's going on in this is that we're dealing with tribulation, then we're going to deal with great tribulation such as the world has never seen, and then God's going to recompense that tribulation on them. Does that make sense? So he's throwing it back on them. So if you want to look at it, we're, we're getting wrath from the devil, wrath from the devil, then God's wrath on them. We're suffering tribulation from the devil, right? We're suffering tribulation for the cause of Christ, and then tribulation is going to be recompensed unto them, okay? So, you know, that word tribulation or affliction, that can be applied to both saved and lost, right? People that are in hell right now, guess what? They're in affliction. But they're not in affliction for the cause of Christ, Okay, so you have to take all these words, and, and again, most all the time when you look at the word tribulation, this is one of the only times that tribulation is used in a sense dealing with the unsaved. Okay, but you can see how he's using, and even in this, you see that, hey, the tribulation's on both sides. They were, we were going through tribulation, then God was putting them through tribulation. Okay, now, going on from this with, uh, with that verse, we see the rapture in there um, dealing with being delivered. Uh, Joel talks about this and the fact that uh, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. So delivered and saved, you know, that's, that's used interchangeably. And that's where, you know, there's going to be great tribulations such as the world has never seen, and except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be what? Saved. Because people are going to be saved uh, out of that because, you know, Jesus is going to come in the clouds. Now in Daniel chapter 12, in verse 2, what we see is we see the resurrection mentioned. So kind of fitting, you know, you're dealing with the rapture and all that stuff being delivered out of great tribulation. But in Daniel 12 and verse 2, it says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So we see the resurrection mentioned here. Now, again, I preached on this with the sheep and the goats and how this is kind of more so dealing with that last resurrection. Right? We had the first resurrection, which is when Jesus comes in the clouds. That's the first resurrection, where we're caught up together with him in the clouds. But then there's going to be the final resurrection after the thousand-year reign. All those that have died in Christ for that thousand years 
are going to be resurrected. They're going to have the judgment seat of Christ. That's the sheep. And then you have the goats. That's going to be all unsafe people, all those that are in hell. Everybody that's died in their sins without Christ from the foundation of the world to the end of the world are going to be brought up and judged according to the works of the great white throne judgment. And so that's what you see is the resurrection of the just and the unjust, the resurrection of life, and the resurrection of damnation. Okay? And so this is kind of jumping forward and kind of even showing you the very end where you're dealing with even the unsaved being resurrected. Okay? So that's what that's talking about. Uh, you can always go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 dealing with that because it does link very well with the resurrection dealing with uh, those that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever because stars are likened unto the resurrection. It uses that as an illustration of the resurrection. So if you look at 1 Corinthians 15, uh, you know, in your spare time you can read through that whole thing dealing with the resurrection. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 40, it says, There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is one another. So what is celestial and terrestrial? Well, terrestrial is, like you think of the earth is terrestrial, so earthly body, and then celestial is a heavenly body. So you think of spiritual body and then physical body, right? Fleshly body. And then it says in verse 41, There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, Notice this, for one star differeth from another star in glory, so also is the resurrection of the dead. So, what are you dealing with? The stars of heaven, you're going to shine as the firmament. But, those that turn people to righteousness, meaning that they, they, they turn people to Christ to where they're imputed righteousness, right? The righteousness of Christ, they're going to shine brighter than the other stars. Okay, so everybody's a star, does that make sense? Everybody that's saved were likened unto stars, and obviously, who would be the sun? The Lord Jesus Christ. He's the sun of righteousness. But, so we're never going to shine more than the sun, <laughs> okay? But, you know, some stars, you think of the North Star, shines brighter than other stars. And so, those that lead more people to Christ are going to shine brighter than those that don't, okay? Doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that no one's going to shine, like someone's not going to shine. It just means that one's going to shine brighter than the next, okay? So, it's kind of just showing you that the resurrection is not equal meaning that it depends on what you did in this life as far as what your resurrection, a better resurrection, as it says in some places. So go back, going back to Daniel, Daniel uh, chapter 12, verse 4. We see that the book of Daniel is sealed, and I kind of already covered this, you know, when we started off this book, is that this is a sealed book. This is not a very open vision, if you want to look at it that way, where it's just very clear what's being said. Now, I believe it has been clear when we get, went through this, but that's because we had the New Testament as a flashlight. But imagine that I didn't have the New Testament, and I was trying to show you all this stuff, okay? And maybe we could have figured out some stuff just going through Daniel, and that's it, right? But let's just be honest. The New Testament puts a lot of light going to the Gospels, going to Revelation, seeing all that stuff. So in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall shall be increased. Now, the reason that I, I, I even want to point it, because I've already preached on this as far as it being a sealed book, is that that's kind of what ends that thought. So you think of verse 1 to verse 4, it's kind of ending that thought, and then it's going to start over, okay? The reason I say that is because what happens in verse 1 is a certain timeline of events. What do we see? Michael the archangel starts off this seven-year period, then there's going to be great trouble, tribulation, and we're going to be delivered out of it. So what's What's that timeline? Or basically, that's what he's talking about. Nothing is mentioned there about God pouring out his wrath. Okay? Then we're going to see this other vision, or basically it's going to go into this other story. Notice in verse, um, verse 5. First, I want you to see that he's going to be dealing with this river. He's like seeing these men on the river. We're dealing with the river of Hittichel, Okay, Because don't forget that this is the same vision that started off in Daniel 10. And in Daniel 10 and verse 4, it says, I, As I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittichel. Okay, so uh, he's in the same place. So if you, see, you see these people by the river, that's why. He started off being by a river, okay. Uh, but in verse 5 there, so Daniel 12, verse 5, it says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river, and one said to the, one, to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? So think about this. What was just said? 
What do you think of Daniel 1? So he's asking, how long is this? Does that make sense? He's calling back to verse 1, saying, how long is it to the end of these wonders? And then notice in verse 7, it says, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, that it shall be for a time and times and in half. So what is that? Three and a half years. And. And. Okay, the reason I say it is because it's not just a time, times, and half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. So notice now it's kind of concluding that. So he keeps saying, Okay, the book is sealed. Then he starts again, The book is sealed. Right? But. The reason I, I emphasize that and because this is your time, times and a half, right up here to the midpoint or the midst of the week, right? But that's not where it ended in verse 1, right? It, it ended because that, that's what starts the Great Tribulation. And we're going to go into the fact that we're going to be delivered out of it. So he's basically saying, you know, you're going to have a time, times, a half time. And then when he scatters the holy people, which is what? after the abomination of desolation, and it says that in, in Daniel chapter 8, talking about how he's going to destroy the mighty and holy people and all that stuff after the abomination of desolation, that's when those wonders are going to be done. So he's basically saying that's the time that you're dealing with. So he's giving you kind of part of the time. You don't really know exactly, though, because it's kind of like, well, it's, it's at least three and a half years. Does that make sense? But there's still this extra amount of time. Once the, he uh, scatters... These people, he, he, he uh, yeah, accomplishes to scatter them. Does that make sense? So there's kind of like tacking on this little extra amount of time that we don't really know yet. But I do believe we're going to see that. And so that's where this 1335 comes in. Okay. So this whole chapter, I believe, is dealing with that time frame, mostly. Okay. There's going to be another time frame that's given, but mostly it's dealing with this. This time frame of the time, time, and half time. So we could think here... We have the abomination of desolation. And after that, that's when the, you know, when you see that, flee into the mountains, and then there's going to be great tribula tribulation such as the world has never seen, right? That happens in the midst of the week, according to Daniel chapter 9. So we know it happens in the middle, so-called, right? But what we see, I believe that that 1335, and I'll read it here in a second, because 1335 is a little more than 1260, right? Because what did we see? We saw 1260 days, 42 months, time, times, and half a time. And my handwriting's horrible. So all these are the same time, right? The time is what? One year. Times would be two years, so that's three years, right? So one plus two, three, and then half a time would be three and a half. 42 months, what is that? Three and a half years. 1260 days, what is that? Three and a half years, if you use a 360 day calendar. So that means 1335 is a little more than 1260. And what do we see with that vision? Say, how long is this vision? A time, times, and half, and when you scatter all the people. So you have your 1335 right here. So what does this time give you? From the beginning of that seven years to the rapture. Now I'm going to prove this further, okay? So I'm going to go into some other timelines, but I'm really going to nail this down to that. That enough, you know, when, when you look at this timeline and how everything works, I think makes sense. Because you can think about it, how long should we have been in that? that whole period, the whole time. So 1260 plus 1260 is, I'm going to write this up here, 2,520 days. Okay, so that's 1260 plus 1260. That's how long we should have been in that, right? Because he gives us into the, the hand of the beast for 42 months. They're given, you know, to make war with the saints. That's how long we should have been there. This is how long we're actually going to be there. Does that make sense? And so that's why the days are shortened, except the days should be shortened 
Isn't it interesting that he even used the term days? And now read this verse in verse 12 here with me. It says in verse 12, Daniel 12, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. But go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. What days? The one thousand three, the 1335 days. What lot? Well, you're dealing with the resurrection. Right? The year of Jubilee. I'm going to get into some of this stuff too. But you're dealing with the resurrection. You're going to be standing in your lot because you're, you're going to be resurrected with everybody. Okay? So he's basically saying, you're going to rest because why? Because Daniel's going to die. He's still dead. You know, like he died a long time ago, right? You're going to rest until the, the end of these days when you're going to stand in your lot. So that's what he's telling uh, Daniel at the end of this book. And so, blessed is he that waited. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Waiteth, you know, those that wait on the Lord. But that terminology is used a lot when it's dealing with waiting, you know, for his second coming even. Um, but there's so many places you can go for that. I'm just going to read some, uh, just some famous ones. Uh, but uh, Isaiah 40, you don't have to turn there, but you can write them down. Isaiah 40 and verse 31, it says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Isaiah 64, 4, For since the beginning of the world men have not heard, neither perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for them that waiteth for him. That's a very famous verse, right? Waiting for the Lord. And what, what are we prepared for? You know, the resurrection, your body, you know, all the things that he's prepared for us once we're with him in heaven. Lamentations 3.26, It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. And it's obviously dealing with salvation uh, with, uh, with, you know, him coming and saving us out of tribulation. Zephaniah 3, go, go to Zephaniah 3, 8. I want you to see this one, dealing with waiting upon the Lord. So, again, if you think about this, Daniel 12, 12, that, that timeline, I believe is calling back to Daniel 12, 1. I believe it's also calling back to that vision that he sees with those two men on the, the riverside. That's basically the timeline he's giving them, right? So in the middle of the chapter, he's kind of giving them part of it, right? He's giving them some information, though. He's saying basically three and a half years in, then he's going to start scattering, you know, the holy people. So he's kind of giving you a little bit of information when that's going to start, the scattering. And then, you know, at the very end of the chapter, he's like, oh, by the way, that's 1335. You know, that's the whole timeline. So that's your, your three and a half years or your 1260 plus 75 days. So that's why when you look on that chart over there, you see that 75 days of great tribulation. That's where we get it from, is this 1335, okay? And so you have the three and a half years of tribulation, or what I would call the beginning of sorrows, right? Um, which would be affliction and, and stuff that's going on in the world. But then you have the great tribulation, which he's coming after the saved, okay? And that's where people are getting beheaded for the cause of Christ and everything that's going on. But in Zephaniah 3.8, it says, Therefore, wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation, even all my fierce anger, for all the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. That sounds like the day of the Lord to me. Now, obviously, that book is dealing with the day of the Lord in a lot of cases. Um, but if you think about this verse, you know, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. You know, this whole idea of looking for his salvation and waiting for his salvation. And I have so many other verses I could show you on that about waiting for the Lord. It deals with that when it's dealing with uh, we're waiting for the redemption to, or to wit the redemption of our body. Right? What is that? The resurrection. What happens at, at 1335? The resurrection. And so I want to show you some other timelines here. So again, what do you get when you have that? Well, you have this time frame from the middle to here of great tribulation, which is 75 days. So that's where we get that. So what is that, like a month? And, that's like two and a half months, you know, that you're dealing with there. So 75 days, and then this other half would be your three and a half years, right? This would be your 1260.
So that's where that number comes from. And so that's where you get that little red area on that chart over there. Now, the next thing that we see in this chapter, so we see that 1335, but we also see this other number in, in chapter 12, verse 11. And I'm going to go through other ones, too, that aren't in this chapter because I just want you to see like where all these numbers go in when you're looking at Revelation 12, when you're looking at Revelation 13. But in Daniel 12, 11, it says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that make it desolate set up, there shall be a thousand... 290 days. So that's where you go from the abomination of desolation. So notice how it's giving you that marker. It's saying, okay, from the abomination of desolation. So what's that? The midst of the week. Out to the very end. And that's where it goes out just a little bit further. Okay? So this is, this would be technically 1260, right? To the end of that seven years. And then you have the three, the 30 days there. And that whole thing would be 1290. And you may ask yourself, you know, why is it 1290? Why isn't it just 1260? Well, you got to think about if you use 360 day years, how many days are actually in a year where we're, where we're going around the sun? It's actually like 365.25, right? That's why we have a leap year where we add a day to February, right? So we have some, sometimes it's, uh, it's normally, you know, 28, right? I'm going to ask you guys because I, I don't know, I'm just having a moment where I'm blanking out here. But then you have a 29 every four years. But it's not always 24 because it's not exactly that either, okay? It's not every four years necessarily. Sometimes there's a little bit difference there. So anyway, all that to say is that if you were to add up, you know, seven years of 360-day years, you're going to be off a little bit, okay? So if you think about it, let's just take 365 days, right? If we were looking at our calendar, so if you're doing 360 for six years, how many days are you missing? 30. That means that next year you're going to add on 30 years, or 30 years, 30 days. Does that make sense? And some calendars actually do this because they do this 360-day uh, calendar, and what they have to do is add on a month. And what that does is recalibrate you to, you all, because if you didn't do that, you'd have springtime and fall, and you'd have summer and winter, because you're basically not keeping up with the rotation around the sun to where your, your seasons are going to be off. And so that's what you have is after six years, you're losing, you've lost 30 days. There's 30 days you need to pick up, so that's what's going on there. So technically, that... 1260, 1290 is your actual seven year period. But what we're going to see is that that 30 days is important because there is a time frame after when the Antichrist is taken out of power and all that stuff, that stuff's going on. Okay? And uh, I do want to go into those timelines a little bit. So I know this is kind of deep and you're, it's all timelines and stuff like that, but I want you to see where all that stuff's coming from. So when you look at that chart over there, it's not just, you know, a whole bunch of stuff you can't really grasp, right? So first I want you to see too, so we see that that timeline, you know, you see all these days that, it, but see how the abomination desolation is kind of like your marker, that middle point, that's kind of like always where you're looking at as far as either going to it, coming from it, or whatever, right? Well, go to the Revelation chapter 12, Revelation 12, chapter 12, I'm going to show you where that first 1260 is mentioned. Now, we kind of already saw that in, in Daniel chapter 12, right? That time, times, and half a time. It said that time, times, and half a time, and then when he shall scatter the people. But it doesn't really tell you that that time, times, and half times ends at the abomination of desolation. Well, Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6, it's going to give us uh, that time period. And for sake of time, I don't have time to go through that whole chapter and go into chapter 13 and all that stuff. So you're just going to have to bear with me. And study this out when you see this. I just want you to, I just want to plaster these, these timelines on here and you can look at it later and see, hey, okay, this makes sense and all that. So Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, it says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she had the place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Now I'll go down to verse 14 because it's going to repeat this, but now it's going to use a different terminology for that same period of time. And it says, 
in verse 14, And to the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished, for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. So this is that first three and a half years. And what do we see? 1260 and a time, times, and half a time. So you see how that's used interchangeably? I'm using days just for sake of argument here, just to keep it all consistent on here. So we're going to use that 1260. That's what you see right here. So Revelation 12, 1260, that's when the dragon is wroth with the woman, right? And he's going to make war with the saints and then the whole the testimony of Jesus Christ. Oh, that's interesting because that's the next thing that happens is that 75 days of great tribulation. Uh, going on from that in the next chapter, in chapter 13, we'll see the second half. So in, in Revelation 13, verse 5, it says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue how long? Forty and two months. Forty and two months. Forty and two months. Now, turn to Revelation. Keep your hand in Revelation, obviously. We will be back there. But uh, turn, turn to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Because notice how he's given 42 months, and then he's going to make war with the saints. He talks about in that same chapter. So 42 months, what is that? That's your three and a half years. Uh, but Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, it's going to say that, but it's going to use a different way of saying the same time. And so Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, it says, And he shall, shall speak great words against the Most High. Sound familiar? Same thing that's said in Revelation 13. And shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times in the dividing of time. So it's just a different way of saying the same thing, right? 42 months or a time, times, and the dividing of times. Now, you don't have to turn there, but in Revelation 12, those same witnesses, the, the witnesses, actually turn there to Revelation 11. Because I want you to see that all these times, actually the 42 months, the time, times, and half a time, and the 1260 are all used to describe the same exact amount of time, which is that second half. That's this right here. This second half. This is how long the beast has 1260. This is how long the beast has. And the power, he's given power for that long amount of time. 42 months, a time times half a time. Or what we'll see, the same amount of time that that's going on, these two witnesses, which I believe is Moses and Elijah, um, are given 1260 days. So in Revelation 11, verse 1, notice what it says. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God, and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. So notice, there's your forty-two months again, right? So that's when the Antichrist comes into power. They're going to tread under foot the outer court, right? Then it says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. So notice how it's that 42 months, that 1260, and that time and times and the dividing of time is all used interchangeably. And it's talking about the beast having power, but also these two witnesses are going to be there. So the two witnesses are given this amount of time. The beast is given this amount of time. And it says we're going to be in his hands for that amount of time. But remember, those days are shortened. Right? That's how long we should have been in his hands. But it was shortened, so it only lasted that much. Or it will only last that much, right? So a lot of this stuff is kind of used in past tense, like it's already happened. But that's why, you know, when it says the days are shortened, that's what it's talking about. We didn't go through that whole 1260 days of great tribulation with the beast, or we won't go through that whole amount of time because we're going to be delivered out of it, okay? Now, go to Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. If you have any questions on this, let me know. My drawing's horrible. Like, my, my writing skills are horrible. That's why they made computers for me as an engineer to, to be able to do that. Um, but honestly, once you, once you get through this, you know, once you get, look at all these numbers, they really are all saying the same thing. Right, do you see how all those numbers I showed you? I showed you Revelation 13, Revelation 11, Daniel 7, and it's all talking about the same time. It's just using different terminology. It's saying 1260, as far as 1260 days, 42 months, a time, times, and dividing of time. 
And like I said, the reason well, you say, why does it keep using all that? Because you can't mess that up. When you use them all interchangeably like that, guess what? There's no other way to look at this besides it's three and a half years, right? And we saw, you know, also that you had 1260 that starts this thing off, abominates desolation, 1260 that goes all the way to here. And that 1260 with the, the, the two witnesses, the reason that it, it's very clear that it's starting at the abomination desolation is because they die before the seventh trumpet sounds, right before the seventh trumpet sounds. So that means that their ministry had to go from when the seventh trumpet sounds all the way back to here, <laughs> okay? And you say, well, what? So, so they're there before the rapture? Yeah. That's why it's true when it says that Elijah the prophet shall come before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, obviously, that happened with John the Baptist and how he was, came in the spirit and power of Elijah. But it's also very true that he's going to send Elijah the prophet before the great and terrible day of the Lord. And guess what? He does. <laughs> so, 75 days before it. And so, uh, that's another side note, though. Um, so Daniel chapter 8, we already covered this, but I want you to see it on the chart. Daniel chapter 8, this is another timeline here. And really, this is the last real timeline, okay? Meaning that that's really kind of what you see as far as all these timelines. They're really kind of telling you the same thing. And a lot of it is, the thing, the why it's kind of confusing is because it doesn't say, okay, the 1,335 days starts off that seven-year period, and then it's going into it, and that's when it stops, right? It's, it doesn't, now, the, the 1290 does. It says, okay, from the, from the, the abomination of desolation to the end, that's what you have. And so you have to kind of, like, think it out and make sure it all fits, okay, when you put all these in there. Now, in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 13, it says, Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint, which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice, and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now this ties right into with where we're dealing with Revelation 11, where it's going to be trodden underfoot for 42 months. Well, what's that mean? Well, after 42 months, it's going to be cleansed. Okay? So when's that happen? Right here. At 42 months, it's cleansed. Because the seventh trumpet sounds, what happens? The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. So he cleanses that. But see, this one goes, this is your longest number, okay, besides the seven years. But again, this, this 12, 12 uh, or I'm sorry, 2,300 days. You see how that's still smaller than that? So the, the 2,520 days. And so you take that number and you go all the way back almost to the beginning. And so you have the 2,300 days. Why that's so big is because it's not just covering the same events that we're dealing with over there. It's dealing with the daily sacrifice, so when they're actually doing the daily sacrifice. Okay? So what this tells me, and that's not straight at all, is it? This is horrible. I need a straight edge. <laughs> Why does it keep going up there? I just can't handle it. All right, here we go. That's too far. I should have just drew it before I got up here and just flipped the thing around. I just figured it might help if you could see me draw it up there. What it's stating is that there's going to be a little bit of time before. So, Michael the Archangel. You know, you think about this is where the beginning is. He's going to cast out the devil. And there's going to be a little bit of time before they start doing sacrifices. Okay, so you can kind of do the math on that and see. But it's pretty much like just over six years of this time that's going on there. So that means you have a little less than a year that's going on into this before you see daily sacrifices being done. Now, that's not to say, you remember that Jesus said, that when you shall see the abomination and desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, then, you know, so basically that's just kind of like your big marker. When you see him being revealed in the temple, there's no doubt then, right? Because they could start doing daily sacrifice today and then it gets taken down and all that stuff. It's not the true, right? Because there's always imposters, there's always people trying to do self fulfilling prophecies, all these different things. But what it's basically stating is that, you know, 
it's pretty close, pretty much at the beginning of that seven years. Not quite. They start doing the daily sacrifices. Because you may ask yourself, well, you know, the daily sacrifices are done. You know, what's this dealing with then? Well, I believe this number is actually telling you when that even starts up again. Does that make sense? They start doing the daily sacrifices, and then it's taken away. That happens right here. So it's giving you this information as far as what's going on through this whole period. It says the transgression of desolation is set up. So the daily sacrifices, you know, sacrifices are done away with. And then they set up the abomination of desolation. And then all the way to when they tread underfoot the court and all that, you know, it says in Revelation 11 for 42 months. And that's when it's cleansed at the end of that. So that's really all your timelines. Okay. But it all fits within that seven years, right? So you see that 42 months and all that. So you just got to figure out which end it's on, right? Where are you at with that? Um, now, when it comes to that cleansing, uh, go to Revelation chapter 10. Because I want to show you that 30 days has significance. There's a reason for that 30 days or like why it's there. You know, like what's that extra 30 days there for? Because the cleansing and that 40, the end of the 42 months happens at the day that the seventh trumpet sounds. But that's not the end of everything that's going to happen. Does that make sense? There's still stuff that happens after the seventh trumpet sounds. You have Revelation 17, 18, and 19 going on before you have the thousand-year reign. Okay? Now, in Revelation 10 and verse 5, I know I already preached on this or I was, I was teaching on this whole aspect of this uh, before, but in uh, verse 5 there it says, and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God shall be finished as he hath declared to his servants, the prophets. And that's what we see in Revelation 11, that after the sixth angel is done, you know, that second woe, it says the seventh angel comes quickly. And that seventh angel sounds, and immediately when that, thing, when that angel sounds, the kingdoms of, this, of, of the world are become the kings of the world, Lord and of his Christ. But there's things that are happening. There's going to be great hail, the cities that are going to fall. And basically, the time that, you know, when that, that happens, notice it says the days. The days of that seventh angel. So that means it's not just one day. It's not like the angel just has one day to do all, all of the things. But what it's saying is that when he begins the sound, that's when time shall be no longer. What time? The times of the Gentiles. The times, you know, when that trotting underfoot is done. And actually, I've actually changed my, uh, my thought process on the times of the Gentiles. I actually believe that that, doesn't, that didn't start when the New Testament started. I believe that's talking about from the Tower of Babel on. Because what is it? It's talking about the nations. And if you think about it, that seven-headed dragon is what you're dealing with, with when you're dealing with that's done. And you think about the, the image that's taken out. What's taken out? It's taken out at the feet, and everything above it falls. So basically, if you want to see the, the ends of the times of the Gentiles, you're dealing with, it's not talking about Old Testament, New Testament, or you know, anything like that. I don't think. I've actually, when I've been looking at this more, I more so think it's dealing with that seven-headed dragon being destroyed. Because what's destroyed? Babylon's destroyed. And the, drag, you know, the dragon's taken out. The Antichrist is taken out. That whole one-world government system is finally taken out. And so that's, I believe you would see, is the time of the nations, if you want to look at it that way, or the time of these, these seven-headed dragon nation thing that's been going on throughout time. That's when that ends, okay? And you can disagree with me on that if you want, but that's kind of where I stay on that as far as the times of the Gentiles go. Um, but the 30 days, what's interesting is if you look at Revelation 18, you say, well, is that enough time to get everything accomplished? Well, Babylon's taken out in one hour, so yeah, I think it's enough time. <laughs> okay, so look at Revelation chapter 18. I just want you to see that. Because you read Revelation 17, 18, and you're like, man, a lot of time is taking on, you know, since the seven trumpets sounded. Not really, <laughs> okay? Now, there's a lot of stuff that happens, but it happens in one hour. So not, it doesn't even take a day for Babylon to fall. It takes one hour. And so in Revelation 18 and verse 9, it says, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication 
and live deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her. And when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. So that doesn't take much time, so I think we can fit that in that 30-day period. But you also had the marriage supper of the Lamb. So in the next chapter, in chapter 19, so what do you see? The seven trumpet sounds. There's going to be this great hail and earthquakes. All the cities of the, of the nations shall fall. And including Babylon is brought into remembrance. And Babylon is going to be taken out in one hour. And then there's going to be this battle of Armageddon, and which is called the marriage supper of the Lamb. So in verse, uh, chapter 19, and verse 6, it says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. You say, well, you know, so it doesn't take more time to get everybody gathered together there. They've been gathering since the sixth vial was cast out. If you look at Revelation 16, the sixth vial is poured out, and it says that the river Euphrates is dried up to make the way of the king of the east, the kings of the east, that they may gather themselves unto the battle of Armageddon. So they've been gathering themselves before the seventh trumpet ever sounds, before the seventh vial is ever poured out. So they're ready to go, if that makes sense, right? The seventh trumpet sounds, and they're ready to go. They're ready to fight with the Lord Jesus Christ and with his army, which is us. And so, yeah, that's what that 30 days is for. And there's also probably an amount of time there for the judgment seat of Christ for the first resurrection. You know, and we're going to be going, and he's going to bind Satan and, and cast him into the bottomless pit. And then he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. So, yeah, there's some things that need to happen in that 30 day slot there. Does that make sense? So, anyway, I just wanted you to see that. And the last thing I really wanted to preach on is going back to that 1335. So, again, I hope all this makes sense. It's really, I think, simple. You have Three and a half years to the abomination and desolation. You're going to have 75 days of great tribulation until we're raptured out. But that Antichrist is still going to be in power for that whole rest of that three and a half years. So you see, three and a half years, three and a half years. That's pretty much what you got going on. And some of these other numbers are just kind of giving you more information. This number saying, hey, there's an extra 30 days tacked on there. There's other things that are going to be going on until the very end. That's where you have Babylon being destroyed in one hour. That's where you have the Battle of Armageddon that's going on. So it's kind of giving you that information. This is telling you, okay, there's going to be daily sacrifices that are going to be given, and it starts close to the beginning of that seven-year period. Not quite the very beginning, but, you know, the devil's got to get his bearing straight as soon as he's cast out of heaven, you know. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, all that to say is that that's where that number comes in there. And the 1335, though, if that's what this cha I believe that's what this chapter is really getting at. Because that's what you start off in chapter in verse 1 there. You're going to have Michael stand up. That's what happens right, right at the beginning. He stands up for his people. There's going to be trouble such as the world has never seen. Great tribulation such as the world has never seen. But then we're going to be delivered out of it, all those that are written in the book. So anybody that's written in the book of life, all the saved, are going to be delivered out of it. Then he talks about this angel, this man on the, in the, the side of the river, one, each side of the river, and he says, you know, how long until these wonders? He says, a time, times, and half a time. And when he shall have scattered all the holy people. So the scattering of the holy people is what you would call the great tribulation. And at the end of the chapter, he gives you the actual timeline of that. Does that make sense? So chapter 12 is really mostly about that, 12, that 1335. Okay? And so at the end, he's kind of like, here's, here's the number. You're going you're gonna to rest, but you're going to stand in your lot at the end of those days, right, at the end of the days, because we're all going to be standing in there. You know, Daniel will be there with us. So will Moses and all the prophets and everybody that was saved from the foundation of the world. Now, what I want to do is, is, is prove this even further to you, that this 1335 is dealing with the rapture, okay? Now, there's three stories in the Bible that I believe will show you this, that it's show you the similar amount of time as far as going into the tribulation that we would be taken out. So I'm going to erase this. So not that you're really sad about that because it wasn't a great work of art. <laughs> but uh, um, 
Yeah, that's why we have the charts over there, because they're really well done and on a computer. But hopefully when you go look at that chart, you can be like, okay, I see where that number came from, and I can see how that fits. Um, so, how long was the seven year period? If you have two 1260 days, right? Two sets of 1260. Right? 2,520 days. Now, what we're saying is that we're only going to be there for that, tw that 1,335, right? So let's see what percentage of that whole time period we're going to be there, OK? You're like, we're dealing with percentages. I don't want to do this. Just bear with me, OK? <laughs> so if you take, and you can bust out your calculator if you want. I have it written down because I already did it with, <laughs> with my calculator. Um, but if you take the 1335 and you divide it by the 12 the 2520 you're going to come out to about I'm going to round up 53%. Okay, it's like 52.9 or 8 or something like that, right? So bear with me, I'm not going to be that that the sig figs on this is going to be 2, okay? So just bear with me here. Uh, anyway, so um now, let's look at some other stories and see if we can get that same type of ratio dealing with it. Go to Jeremiah chapter 52, Jeremiah 52. And if this doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will, and maybe you just don't like math, okay? But to me, this blows my mind how perfect this is, okay, and how much this does fit, okay? I didn't need this, okay, honestly, for me to be convinced on this, but this just solidifies it that it's in... What I'm going to show you is something in Leviticus, in Jeremiah, and in the book of John that's going to prove this ratio here of going through tribulation or the amount of time or space in, in this ratio here. And think about that, the, the space and time. Leviticus is in the first five books, right? Jeremiah is in the midst of like the Old Testament and all that stuff. And then you have John that's you know pretty much New Testament, right? It's written in the New Testament. And all of it lines up and it all matches. But the Bible's written by man, so nothing to see here. Anyway, so Jeremiah 52 and verse 31, this is the story of how Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim was taken captive when Jehoiakim was taken out and you know Nebuchadnezzar came in. And notice what it says in verse 31. It says, And it came to pass in the 7 and 30th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the, 20, 20, or in the 12th month, in the 5 and 20th day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and brought him forth out of prison. And he spake kindly unto him, and set, him in his, set his throne above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon, and changed his prison garments, and he did continually eat bread with him all the days of his life. Okay? So how long was that captivity for? 70 years. We see that over and over again. 70 years. How long was he in that captivity for until he was released? 37. So we have 37 years out of 70. And Brother Dave, or if anybody's doing a calculator, they can check me on this. That's your ratio. It's like 0. 0.528, okay? And it, it all round up to that, okay? If you're rounding up, that's where it would come to, okay? Now, even in this story, think about this. You're in captivity, so you're in tribulation, you're in trials, and then you're taken out. He's given new garments. He's given new garments, and he's eating, and the king has changed, right? You go from Nebuchadnezzar to evil Merodach, and basically the first year of his reign, he's, he's bringing him out of prison and setting him up with new garments. Isn't that amazing how that fits perfectly? Oh, but there's more. I feel like I'm on an infomercial. <laughs> go, to, go to Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25. Never thought math could be fun, right? <laughs> okay. 
it's almost when you see this, you're just like, that can't be, that can't be. It's too, it's too, it's too uncanny. I mean, we're not even talking like, well, it's close to that, right? Let's say it's like 0 0.54, 0 0.55. You'd be like, well, that's close. It's literally the same. Like, do the numbers, you know? It is literally the same thing. Now, go to Levit Levit Leviticus chapter 25, verse 9. It says, Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. So what we believe is basically you had the Feast of Trumpets, which would represent going to war, going to tribulation, and then you'd have the Day of Atonement, which would represent the rapture, okay, dealing with the Feast of the Lord. Well, on the 50th year, you know, every 50 years, you'd have this year of Jubilee, and on the Day of Atonement, they would blow this trumpet. So this is a special event that would happen every 50 years, and basically everybody's set free, and they're giving back all their, all their lands and giving back their whole inheritance. All that sounds familiar to the rapture when we're... Daniel's going to stand in his lot, right? You think of inheritance as being a lot. It's a lot allotted to you, right? Um, anyway, so what day of the month is that? It says the 10th day of the seventh month, okay? So you could just do this with math, you know, and I, I'm going to just say it. You have six months, so leading up to the seventh month, right? So we're at the very beginning of the seventh month. That means you have six months before that. Six months, 30 days, okay? 30 days each month, what do you have? 180 days, right? 180 days to the, the very beginning of the seventh month, but we're not at the very beginning of the seventh month when that happens, right? We're 10 days into it. 10 days into it would give you, I'll put it over here, 190 days into the year. One hundred ninety days into the year, and how many days are in the year when we're dealing with biblical prophecy and all these different things, or how they did it? Three hundred and sixty. Three hundred and sixty days. <clears throat> That's your ratio. Now you can check me on that. Point five three. Isn't that amazing how that works? And all these stories that I'm showing you relate to end time. Like, if you think about how that would relate. It's not like this is just some crazy story that had nothing to do with what we'd be talking about, right? Because you're dealing with this guy being in prison and being in captivity, and then he's released and given new garments. You have this case where you have this year of jubilee and a trumpet sounding. Now, that sounds familiar to the, the trumpet shall sound and the, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And you had the year of Jubilee where people are giving back all their inheritances and all that stuff. And so you can definitely see how that would fit. Well, let's look at this last one I'm going to show you here. Now, this one's a little harder to... See, those ones, that's straight up Bible. There's nothing really there to like... Besides, unless you want to question my 360 days, as far as uh, that being the amount of year, days in a year, right? Um, and how they did that. But um, if you look at John chapter 6... John chapter 6. This one's a little harder because I had to use Google Maps and GPS to figure out a distance, okay? So, barring that's not wrong, okay? So, I'll show you what I mean. I'll tell you why I mean this, okay? So, this is the story where J Jesus walks on water, okay? So, in, in John 6 and verse 16, it says, And when even was now come, his disciples went down into the sea and entered into a ship, and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind and blew. So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and draw, drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he said unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly, willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land where they went. So, I'm going to, first of all, let's see what sea are they on. Well, in the very first verse there of chapter 6, we see that it's the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. Okay, so verse, verse there says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. Okay, so this is the Sea of Galilee. Not, it's not hard to find on the map when you're looking at the map of Israel. Okay, you have 
the Sea of Galilee, and then you have the Dead Sea. You know, they're, they're, you can't miss it. But anyway, what we see is that they're going to Capernaum. So we know where they're going, okay? And, but we also know where they came from because when you go down to verse 23, they're looking, they're like, where did, how did you come over here, you know? They're basically like, they didn't see them get on the ship to go to Capernaum. And it says in verse 23, Howbeit there came other boats from where? Tiberias. Nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. So if you know the story, they basically went across a ship, and he did the miracle of the five loaves, or I'm sorry, the, the 5,000, where he fed them with bread and fish and all that. Then they come back. So basically he's saying Tiberius is where he did that, around that area. It was nigh unto that. And then they got back into a ship, but Jesus didn't ride with them. And they're, they're rowing, you know, going on the ship to Capernaum. Okay? Now what we see is that when this happens, in Mark, Matthew 14, verse 25, it says, In the fourth night, or fourth watch of the night, this is when this happens. And you think about it, so what, what are you dealing with? You're dealing with basically the last part of the night. Okay? It's about to be dawn. And so you can think of how this would apply to tribulation, how you're kind of like at the very end of the tribulation there when Jesus came walking on the water because it's at the fourth watch. And it's also boisterous. They're in this storm. They're afraid for their lives. Right? It's this great storm. And so you can think of commotions, trials, tribulations, all this stuff that's going on. As soon as Jesus gets on the ship, what happens? The wind ceases, and they're immediately in Capernaum. Did you catch that? Verse uh, 21, it says, And they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land where they went. What happens the moment you get raptured? You're immediately with the Lord in the air, right? You're, you're changing in the twinkling of an eye, right? You say, okay, I see where you're going with the illustration. Does that fit, though, with our ratio? <laughs> okay, well, it says that they rode 25 or 30 furlongs. Now, a furlong is what we would call like a block. So if you're in a city, like a, one block would be like a furlong, which would be like an eighth of a mile, okay? So unlike West Virginia, there's a lot of cities that actually have uh, grid patterns when it comes to their roads, okay? And, and those roads have uh, similar distances between the roads, okay? Here it's a spider web. So if you're from West Virginia, you may not know what I'm talking about. But if you went to Arizona, and you said, okay, I need to get to, you know, I'm on 10th Street, and I need to get to 20th Street. Well, you need to, that's going to be, so let's say eight streets, just to make it easy here. You need to go one mile, okay? If you're on 1st Street, you need to get to 8th Street, one mile, right? Because they're all a quarter, or they're all eighth of a mile. So, knowing that, if you go, if you just looked up the distance from Tiberias, so I'm going to do my drawing skills here. I didn't get a picture. I should have just got a picture. So if you look at the Sea of Galilee, it's kind of like this. I'm going to make it like that. All right. So Tiberius is right here, and then Capernaum's like right here. Okay. Similar, somewhere around there. So basically, they got on a ship and went there like that, instead of going around the land. Okay. So they got on a ship. Here's Tiberius. Here's Capernaum. That straight line right there is 6.33 miles. Okay. So that's the that they just straight shot went there on the ship, right? So 6.33 miles, if you convert that to furlongs, which means you're breaking it down into eighths of a mile. Does that make sense? So you basically just multiply uh, the 6.33 by eight, okay? Not to get too crazy with math here. That'd give you 50.64 furlongs, okay? So that's the whole distance, the whole distance 50.64 furlongs. Now, what's interesting about this passage is that it says 25 or 30. So 50.64, 50.64. So do you see that? It doesn't give you a definite, like they were exactly at such and such furlongs. They're at 25 or 30. So 25 gives you this ratio. And 30 gives you this ratio. What's in between that ratio? Well, 
So they were literally between 25 and 30 furlongs when he came to walk on the sea. And you had that same ratio as far as how far they were into it. And in this story, you see that immediately, as soon as he came on that ship, they were over in Capernaum. They were where they needed to go. And you see the same thing with Jehoiakim. You see the same thing with the year of Jubilee. And guess what? You see the same thing dealing with that number that's in Daniel chapter 12. And so I didn't need all that, but that pretty much bolsters that, I'm, that we're right about that. Okay? Because that's uncanny. In my, now, this one I kind of was studying out because I remember hearing about that one right there, but I never really just studied it out my, myself and tried to figure it out. But again, this one isn't as strong because this one, you're going to like Google Earth and trying to figure out the distance and it doesn't tell you in the Bible the actual distance that it would have been and stuff like that. It tells you how far they rode. But, I mean, when you take a straight line course on the sea, that's what you come out to. So, that's uncanny to me that they were so about 53% into it. Right? So, I think that's interesting. I think that's just fun to see. And to me, that knocks my socks off. I'm like, listen, this is, this is Leviticus where that number's given. This is Jeremiah, this is John, and this is Daniel. And they all fit. So, tell me again that the Bible's written by man, and that, that who's going to think to put all that information in there and that that would all fit just like that? And so... Um, but the 335 days, yes, I do believe that's talking about the rapture. Okay? Six ways to Sunday, or four ways, however you want to look at it. You know, how many times we're looking at it on there. Um, but I hope that helps with the timelines. You know, that's the book of Daniel. And I know we went through some really deep stuff when it comes to this subject. Um, but, you know, I think it's pretty straightforward. Once you, once you get a grasp of some of this stuff, and uh, it's not that complicated, really. Uh, we're going to have a time of, 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 you know, the beginning of sorrows. The abomination of desolation is going to happen. We're going to have a, a time of trouble or a tribulation such as the world has never seen for about 75 days. And then we're going to be saved out of that, and then God's going to pour out his wrath, and then it's done. Right? That's pretty much how you look at it. And, uh, and that kind of helps you, too. You see the abomination of desolation. We don't have much time. Right? Two and a half months. What's that to eternity? So... You got to think about that. You got to be prepared for that when you're going through great tribulation, saying, "Listen, we only have two and a half months. Let's do this, right? Time's up. Let's do this. We're gonna go serve the Lord, and you know, whatever happens, happens because it's all gonna be over here soon anyway." So let's end with a word of prayer, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for today, and thank you for uh, Mountain Baptist Church. Thank you for the, the, uh, the all those that come here, and just for the soul winners, and and Lord, just pray to be with those that heard the gospel today, and Lord, that uh, you'd uh, just your word would have. Uh, power and, and that they would uh, maybe understand it, especially uh, the, the man that had the stroke. Lord, I just pray that he, he believed it and got saved. We thank you for the book of Daniel, such a great study through it, and Lord, just so much uh, power in your word and so much infinite uh, material that we can find out of it. And Lord, just pray to be with us throughout this week. And Lord, we love you and pray all in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.